Hi, everybody. Peter Greenberg here. And now my favorite topic, I'm, I'm sorry to say it really is, security, airport and airline. And here to talk about that, the president of Inside Security, Chris Falkenberg. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm one of those people who believes, and, and, and by the way, anytime you want to disagree with me, you just jump right in. But I'm one of those guys who believes that the actual model of airport and airline security before 9-11 was really a sort of a psychological attempt to deter truly emotional people from taking the plane to Cuba. I mean, that's really the way it was set up. And then after 9-11, and I know I'm going to be a little harsh here, and, and, I'm, and I'm not questioning people's intentions, but it's sort of designed to make people who don't fly very often feel better. But those of us, including me, who do fly very often, we sort of know better. And so here we are coming up on, you know, this year coming up will be the 10th anniversary of, of 9-11. Um, nothing we're going to be celebrating, but we are going to acknowledge it. And I guess the question is, are we safer now than we were before 9-11? And I guess the answer has to be, if you look at the numbers, yes. It's undoubtedly true that we're safer from a variety of types of attacks on the aircraft, but largely that's because the the approach, the Cuban hijacker approach, which is one in which we all cooperate, we fly safely wherever we have to go, discharge the criminal, and off we go again, is what ultimately led to the September 11th attacks or enabled them to occur. So some of the most dramatic changes, or the, the, the changes that make us the safest, were really operational and pretty, as far as the passenger experience, fairly de minimis. You don't open the door. Um, you take the plane down right away. You don't cooperate with the person who's, uh, who's holding the crew hostage. Um, but I think we are safer from a wider variety of, of types of offenses. So the, uh, you know, the Pan Am Lockerbie sure. bombing, I don't think that could occur. Uh, well, to remind everybody what happened there, I mean, you know, about five or six things had to combine that day for that to happen. First of all, and I covered that story, you know, the uh, the X-ray machines weren't even working in Frankfurt. The dogs they hired weren't even bomb sniffing dogs. They borrowed them from a kennel. I mean, how stupid. Uh, and the reason why that plane blew up where it did was not part of the plan. There was a 48-minute gate hold that night at Heathrow. So uh, they really were trying to get that plane to blow up over the ocean and not blow up over land. Uh and because it blew up over land, it allowed the authorities, little by little, to get enough evidence to find out what really happened. But you don't think that could happen today? Well, th that that series of circumstances is is always a job in security. You know, the the, the old saying, I forget to whom it's attributed, but uh, security people have to be lucky every day, and the perpetrator has to be lucky once. And you know, we knew that in the Secret Service. Although, so, yes, you do. But but and then there's the other quote that I'll share with you. That is the the absence of an attack doesn't necessarily presume the presence of great security. That that's entirely true. Yeah. I think we're probably at a, a middle space between you know, the, the dogs from the kennel and truly able um, explosive detection. Yeah. The, the, the size of the problem, the challenge that TSA embraces every day and the enormous volume of travelers uh, and the extraordinary both legal and political issues they have to deal with, um, I don't think has been totally... I don't, I don't think the tiger has been totally tamed, but I think because of the size of the problem, it's a, uh, it will take many years for us to get to a point where we have the right combination of efficiency, uh, efficacy, and, and time-wastingness where we have a, yeah. an appropriate degree of security. It's become such a large bureaucracy, and I worry about the training levels of their agents who are the, the frontline guys and the frontline women because I give them the, the benefit of the doubt that they, they are well-intentioned and want to do a great job. But because of the system and the process that they're putting into, that they're put into, I don't know if I could do that job. I, I think that after about five bags going through the conveyor belt, I'd be asking for a price check in aisle five. I mean, I mean that's a monotonous, Look, tough that, job. That, that, that's a great problem with with um, with standard metal detectors or, yeah. or with standard, um, you know, looking at video images. The problem is if you see people all day, and, and your experience is for every thousand bags, maybe you see right. a test object, and you know, the test objects are another great topic because they're so and they always uh, get through. Not only they get through, but they're totally out of sync with what sort of modern weapons are. If you came up with how am I going to sneak something on, it would look a lot le more innocuous than what, what folks are tested on. So the real challenge is how do you keep someone focused on right. looking and identifying and being proactive for something which is dangerous when 100 percent of the time they've seen stuff which is suspicious and it always turns out to be safe. So here's my question. If we went to an evidence room right now in the Federal Bureau of Investigation or the U.S. Marshal Service and took out Richard Reed's shoes, the shoes that he tried to detonate on that American Airlines flight, and took them to any U.S. airport and put them through that conveyor belt, would they even show up on the screen? At the beginning of the shift, 
maybe at the end of the shift, I imagine they'd get through. The thing about Reed is, you know, he was stopped. He 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 missed his initial flight. Yes. Um, and it and was, they still let him go on the next one. They still let him go on the next one. So it, it it. But you know that brings me up to that point because he was leaving from Paris, and let me, let's talk about that. Every and I'm just going to use Paris as an example, but it is by no means the only example. Every time I leave from a foreign airport flying back to the United States, they ask you the three same stupidest questions that anyone, even if their language, their first language isn't English, can figure out the answers to. It's always yes, yes, and no. Did you pack the bags yourself? Had they been with you all the time? And did anybody give you anything? So you can basically say to any terrorist, even if his English isn't bad, hey, buddy, it's yes, yes, and no, and off he goes. Well, you know where those questions began. Those questions all began with L. Al. Yes, because, and, because that woman was given that the, the, the package. Yes, um, and L. Al is able to do it well, and so but you know why they're able to do it well because they don't ask questions that could be answered by yes or no anymore. They, For example, I mean, look, your former Secret Service. Let's talk about police investigation. If I think you killed somebody, the first thing I'm going to say, Chris, is not I'm not going to ask you, did you kill him? Because you'll give me an yes or no. Where does that leave me? You're going to say no. What I'm going to say is, Chris, what'd you do with the gun? Now, if you answer that question, we got something to talk about, right? That's not profiling. That's common sense. Another question is, how would you feel if somebody killed someone under these circumstances? Well, then, and, now you're really and, getting and, it right. And yeah, if right. the answer is, well, maybe there's a reason, then you know you've got your right person. But so the 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 you know, those three questions yeah. is one of a variety of Israeli exports, which many people in Congress and others point to as a holy grail of security. The the problem with exporting that. So TSA has made great strides with behavioral assessment. So the problem with exporting that that model, that Israeli model, is the the demographic background of people who travel connect. to Israel yeah. is much much more limited than the people who take you know take flights from from Des Moines to Chicago every day. They have, I think, probably 14 flights, international flights And they have a, enough time a, a day. And, and personnel to do um, that, yes. It, so it's a very small operation. To export all of that to the hundreds of flights that we have taking off, both domestic and foreign, yeah. uh, is, is an enormous challenge. And it is. I, I suspect it's a, it's a challenge you probably can't pay for. But you also brought up another interesting point. You talk about behavioral stuff. Um, I'll, I'll give you this scenario, and I haven't tried it yet, but something tells you I would work, right? It's a hot August afternoon, and I show up wearing four overcoats, two mufflers, galoshes, and sunglasses, but my picture matches my driver's license, and my, my driver's license matches my boarding pass. They're going to let me through. They, they'll let you through. Hopefully something that obvious would... And yet we had the underwear bomber who was not even wearing an overcoat in the middle of winter and had no checked bags coming from Africa to Detroit. They let him through twice, not just once, twice. That's outside of TSA jurisdiction, though. Yeah. So th th that introduces it in another huge issue. What's our ability to impact security operations right. abroad? Because it seems as though the largest, or the most significant threats arise abroad from inbound U.S. flights and our ability to... Um, to design those sorts of programs, or or to or to have foreign um, foreign authorities take our suggestions, I think is as much a function of security as it is national foreign policy. Yeah, because we are in the global village, we have to yes. do it that way.